Thank you, Phil, and, uh, and thank you, uh, Matt, for uh, making all these wonderful products for our uh, conference. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, if the wallets did not sell out last night at our community night, we should have some at our endowment table outside. I encourage you to, um, uh, to get a product and, uh, and support uh, Matt's business and all of the, uh, uh, the great team that he has over in Koshrai. Uh, they also have made these really nice notebooks for us. I know that they're very limited, but uh, they're uh, refillable. So you can buy an A5 size notebook and uh, keep using the banana paper uh, jacket. So we're really excited to have these. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce our panel on uh, agency directions toward a sustainable future. And I'm really happy to have um, uh, some of our new directors and administrators and uh, our, our new first gentleman, or uh, sometimes he likes to be called the first dude, on our panel. <laughs> so uh, starting here on, um, on your left is uh, uh, Ms. Rebecca Respicio, the director of the Guam Energy Office, Ms. Chelsea Munya Brecht uh, from the Guam Department of Agriculture, Mr. Tyrone Titano from the Guam Bureau of Statistics and Plans, Mr. Larry Gass from the Guam Solid Waste Authority, and then uh, first gentleman, Mr. Jeffrey Cook. Uh, so can we give them all a round of applause for being here? Uh, so for this panel, we want, since uh, everybody is uh, pretty new in, in these positions uh, with uh, the new administration, with uh, Governor Leon Guerrero uh, coming in uh, to office uh, in, in January, and you met her on uh, Tuesday on the first night of our conference. Uh, we'd like to see where these agency directions are going, hopefully toward a sustainable future. And so we'll give them a few minutes each to talk about uh, their plans for the agencies, uh, perhaps some of their challenges and uh, what, they, um, what, what uh, they'd like to, uh, uh, to, to do for, um, for the island as well. And then we'll have some time for, for Q&A uh, and we'll have the mics passed around at that time. Okay, so first we'll, we'll start here. Um, uh, to, to my left, uh, Ms. Rebecca Respicio from the Guam Energy Office. Thank you, Austin. Um, I looked at him and I said, oh no, does that mean I'm first? And he said, yes, ladies first. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for having us. And um, this conference has just been so instrumental and the faces that are here I know are very passionate about the future for our island and at the Guam Energy Office. Um, first, I just want to say that um, we are 100% federally funded. We do have a small amount of money um, that is local, that is from our local um, government that allows us to do a vehicle rebate program for plug-in electrical vehicles. So that's uh, something pretty exciting. Um, but one of our biggest programs that we are pushing forward in the island is called the Weatherization Assistance Program. And so if you've been hearing on the radio or on KOM last night, we were talking about this opportunity for families who qualified based on an income um, to be able to get energy efficient appliances in their home at no cost to them. So what we do is if you do qualify, we go into your home and we assess your lighting, your um, window air conditioning units, the refrigerator that you're using. And if it is all a uh, sucking way too much energy on our island, we replace it. And so I just also want to take the time to officially announce, uh, because it happened just when we were here at the conference yesterday, we received official notice that we were awarded our 2019 program funding um, from the US Department of Energy to continue the weatherization program and to help more families on the island. So we have that going on. Um, our table has the application that shows the income bracket. So folks, even if you don't qualify or don't feel you do, I'm pretty sure you know people who will. So what we want you to do is help us to get the word out. We want to change as many homes and weatherize it and make sure that um, people are lowering their energy consumption and also saving money because everybody needs the help. And when it's no cost to them, even though it sounds too good to be true, it, it is, it's true and it's, it's available. So let's get the word out. Um, again, in the government, and what I'm really happy is our oversight, um, Senator Sabina Perez, along with the senators that you even see in the room, obviously they care so much about our environment. So 
the Guam Energy Office is committed to taking our government to the next level with regards to energy conservation. And Senator Perez is working with other legislative senators to make um, some changes in the government, like um, there's legislation on that's being um, looked at to mandate the purchase of vehicles and government agencies to make sure that if they are gonna purchase a regular sedan that they get um, the plug-in electric vehicle um, instead of that. And um, we're working on more policy that's going to expand that plug-in rebate, electric vehicle rebate program to offer it. So right now as it stands, it, it's only available to like individual people. And unfortunately, those cars are really small. And so families don't choose that because it doesn't fit enough people for their families. So the legislation that's on the floor is to give that rebate opportunity to businesses so that we could just get better cars on the road that is zero emissions and um, also to nonprofit organizations. So be looking forward to that if you're a nonprofit and you're in the market for a new vehicle, you could get, if soon enough, you'll be able to avail yourself of that rebate program. So there's a lot of things. Um, last week, um, we met with the Assistant Secretary for um, the Department of Interior and we're gonna look at possible funding or go after funding to get our government buildings, to get solar panels and just, just um, educate our new leaders on simple things that they can do in their agency to help conserve energy. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Um, next we have uh, Chelsea Munya Brecht, the director of the Department of Agriculture here in Guam. Hi, half a day, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today, Austin. Um, I honestly feel like if I started to talk about everything that I was excited about at the department and started listing all the things we wanted to do that was sustainable, we would be here for, I think I'd be your next, um, what is it, the version of TED Talk, C Talk. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on some of the few things that I'd like to start doing um, with the department. And it all starts with a shift in mindset. Uh, Guam, ha we have several farmers on Guam, and a lot of them are aging out of the process, but part of that aging out is because they're using labor-intensive management styles for their farms, and also the use of um, pesticides and chemicals and such. So some of the first things we like to do is work towards opening up the conversation about changing our farming methods and styles. And some of that includes incorporating natural farming techniques or um, what I learned, through, which ironically enough, I learned through the Department of Agriculture when they had a workshop was on Korean natural farming techniques. And these are similar to styles that are also used in Japan or were used in Japan before everyone shifted to this large scale corporate ag agriculture um, type of style. And this involves working with the environment rather than trying to change the environment to suit your needs. Um, and if we allow people to work with the environment and allow things to grow as they're supposed to grow, it, we find that the biology kind of manages itself um, with minimal input or change that's necessary from humans. So what we'd like to do is we started clearing some of the property on the side of the department. And I'd like to use those as um, practice areas where we practice in one section, we'll start Korean natural farming. In another section, we'll start working with um, microorganisms um, and like lactic, ba lactic acid bacteria and uh, other small microbes that we use that will help uh, replenish the soil and just different variety of techniques and invite the public to participate. We, um, <laughs> when talking with our Agriculture Development Services Chief, John Borja, we were both really excited about the idea of starting monthly workshops for people in the community and inviting them to participate so that we can start exposing them to these different types of um, techniques that they can try. And we're more than happy to work with them at their home and try to do that or help them through that process. Um, we also started working with University of Guam 4-H, which I'm so thrilled has been expanding from fisheries into farming. And so I love the idea of getting to see 4-H students on Guam uh, fitting that 
image of, you know, they're in the farm or they, they're working with animals, then that's just this vision that I have in my head about that. And we can start with them. Uh, they're gonna be our new generation of farmers, so then let's start shifting that mindset or exposing them to that now so that we're not trying to change their minds later, which, you know, um, it's, it's not always a nice thing to say, but sometimes what I do say is that I give up on working with older people because <laughs> it's harder to change their minds. If we start working with the youth, then we expose them to that, they're open. Um, but I haven't given up, I'm j it's just a joke. I say that. I do in, I, inappropriate jokes, that's my thing. Um, so don't always take me at my word for those things sometimes. Um, <laughs> she said, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> um, what else do I have? We have, oh, aquaculture and aquaponics. I'm super excited about this. And Mel did, Mel pointed out something for me that I appreciate and I hadn't realized, or I mean, I knew we were doing it, but I didn't conceive it in a whole picture was that we're already working with the University of Guam and Gita on, in projects that we're trying to align all the work that we're doing because we find that at least with the university and us um, that we're both working on the same sorts of things so why not just bring us all together and collaborate and make it that much more powerful for our island and with the support of Gita and the development programs that they have I think we're in a really have something to show um, in the next couple of years, and it's gonna be pretty phenomenal for everyone. Um, we wanna expand, or, well, yeah, expand, because our f there are a few um, aquaponic farms on Guam, and we'd like to be able to increase that. Um, and the way I sort of see it is that we work small scale, starting with individual people who would like to try these projects, rather than having one person be dominating the market. We have several little small sectors of it so that everyone has something to contribute. Um, and in terms of sustainability, that's all I see with this. I don't want us to have, or to fall into the example of some of the aqua, well, aquaculture systems that we see nationwide where they become just big giant cesspools of pollutants in the community and yes you can get fish out of it but then the you you know you question the health of the fish you question the health of the water that it's sitting in because of the things that they feed and the antibiotics it's just it's gross and i don't want to eat that and i sure don't want to support feeding that to our community so let's change it and i know that there are examples out there um one of the ones that I've been exposed to is in Palau, where you have sustainable processes that allow you to do this and do it in a way that is in alignment with the environment and with your community, and it doesn't force us to change our cultural beliefs about how we protect nature for ourselves and for everyone around us for the next seven generations. Um, well, see, like I said, there's a lot I can go through here. I haven't even touched on our forestry conservation system. Let's just say that the Department of Agriculture absolutely is going to do everything possible to be sustainable in every facet that we can. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Chelsea. Uh, I, I wanna thank you also for your help with our field trips tomorrow that, um, that Phil mentioned this morning. We have one to Cocos Island and two biologists from the Guam Department of Agriculture uh, will be assisting um, uh, our Sea Grant uh, bio turtle biologist, Sefa. So there will be uh, CJ, the, the turtle biologist from the um, Department of Agriculture, helping to, to show us the, the turtle nests, hopefully, and tracks. And then AJ Tornito, uh, a bird biologist. That, you, know, you may have heard that uh, we've lost most of our native birds, but there's a population of the Guam Brel, the cocoa bird, that live on uh, Coco Island, so hopefully he'll be able to call out to them and have some appear for you to see. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Okay, Mr. Uh, uh, Tyrone Titano from the Guam Bureau of Statistics and Plans. Uh, thank you very much, Austin, and, and thank you and the University of Guam for this invitation to appear on this panel, and, and I, I think I have to thank you for some of the most comfortable seating I've ever had in a panel discussion. <laughs> um, you know, sustainability is, um, I'm, I'm sure, is a goal we all share, and as an island community, we go into that, uh, achieving that goal with uh, some advantages. You know, being geographically isolated, we deal with somewhat of a closed system. But on the other hand, a lot of the factors that affect our sustainability are entirely uh, beyond our control. And we see that in our economy here, where the two pillars of our economy is tourism and federal spending, either military spending or non-military spending. But as we've seen all where for our recent history, um, they're subject to changes in, in budget policy in Washington or the health of the Asian economy. And of course, on the environmental front, 
um, climate change is a major threat to our environment infrastructure, and Guam not being an industrial economy is not contributing to the greenhouse gases that is causing climate change, but like other island and seashore communities, we are on the front lines of bearing the brunt of climate change and its adverse consequences. So any attempt for a sustainable community uh, has also has to incorporate the concept of building resiliency. Now, being in the typhoon belt, we're all familiar with, or with building resiliency, even though we may not have called that, in preparing for typhoons. Our, uh, a lot of residential um, infrastructure or housing is built in a lot of concrete homes. Uh, that's true of a lot of the commercial uh, office space, public facilities. Our infrastructure, a lot of it is, is uh, particularly power lines are built uh, underground. And there are backups for everything, including water and, and power and et cetera. So we're, we, as we go through typhoons, we do a lot better than a lot of communities, uh, particularly those in the mainlands where they're, you see communities built on largely wooden structures, or, uh, which, God help us, trailer parks. And they, they tend to he, get um, he, much more damage than we would, we would actually uh, bear because we spent literally generations building resiliency and preparing for typhoons. But the idea of building resiliency is not only preparing for the stuff that you know is coming, like eventually you'll get a typhoon, but it's also preparing for things that you don't know are coming and prepare the capacity to deal with these threats as they arrive here. And so that idea is part and parcel of Governor Leon Girl's new uh, Coral Reef Resiliency Strategy, which she signed off by executive order uh, last month, and which is being prepared for implementation by a 13-member cabinet committee chaired by my colleague, the Director of Agriculture and should be in place uh, by June. It covers the broad range of issues dealing with the uh, protection and preservation of our reefs, including uh, terrestrial concerns, and there are recommendations for Im improving uh, uh, soil catchments to prevent sediment runoffs. It deals with uh, direct action in, in order for the uh, preservation and restoration of, of our coral reefs. It deals with issues dealing with um, uh, recreational tourism uh, uses. One of the recommendations in the strategy is to incorporate marine education in the tourist guide certification program so they can educate tourists about the proper care of the, re of the reefs. And there is also um, a, a component there about building resiliency in the human communities and incorporating climate change into it. In the uh, previous uh, local action strategies that, are, that this is replacing here, climate change was a factor, but in the new coral reef resiliency strategy, be front and center as something as a concern to build resiliency for. But more importantly, the, the new coral reef resiliency strategy actually steps up the planning, uh, the monitoring here, and the resource management regimes by not only the government, but also uh, federal stakeholders here and local um, uh, uh, community groups and private sector partners as well. And so it shifts the whole paradigm from a more reactive mode to a more proactive mode. And helps, and that's really the the the, the strength of it at, at, the, at this uh, for addressing the coral reefs because you are going to continue with climate change for years to come, but also for things that we may not actually expect on the horizon. Uh, one of the more interesting things that are uh, cropping up on the national agenda regarding coral reefs is what is happening in Florida. There's a outbreak of a disease affecting the uh, uh, stony corals in Florida. It's called the floral disease, or also the stony coral tissue loss disease. And it's running rampant in, a, in an arc of about 200 nautical miles, going from like north of Miami all the way to the end of the, of the uh, Florida Keys. Now, stony corals are one of the key corals in actually building a coral reef. And it's like wiping out by leaps and bounds. And there are other corals that, that also build, but corals grow really slowly. So when these ones are getting wiped at a far quicker weight than the other um, uh, corals can actually replace them here, it's, it's uh, it's a really approach, it is a, a considered a, a crisis situation in Florida. Um, they're even, they even resorting to things like sending divers out to apply antibiotics onto corals to protect them. They're in the process of transplanting in the affected areas, which is a, a long stretch of period. They're uh, transplanting uh, species of coral reefs uh, from the, flo uh, the Florida coastline and relocating them to aquariums as far away as Iowa. Uh, in order to preserve the biodiversity. So when they do figure out, and they haven't quite figured out yet what exactly is happening there, and they try to restore the reefs, at least they have the biodiversity and the coral reefs uh, uh, plantings in order to restore the reefs. Uh, beyond that, uh, the disease seems to be spreading beyond Florida. There's already reports of uh, it going in Virgin Islands, and there are uh, reports of it appearing in the Dominican Republic, in Jamaica, and on Cancun, Mexico. And that one they don't, the scientists have a full explanation for that because the uh, 
the, the, the incidents look random because they do not conform with what the oceanographic data is for the Caribbean. In other words, the current do not explain where these incidents are reporting and the timing of them reporting. However, there is a developing suspicion, is, and that stems that if you put an overlay of the shipping lanes uh, on the Caribbean, then there's a pattern and a possible correlation between the incidence of this disease appearing in the Caribbean and the shipping lanes. It may, they're, they're thinking that it may be being spread by ballast water. Now, at this point, it's just a theory. They have not, uh, it's kind of early days and haven't, haven't actually proven whether this is actually true or not. But if it is proven to be correct, then that means what's happening in, in Florida and the Caribbean is not just a regional problem, but it's a global one. And it may actually at some point reach us here in the Pacific. You prepare for the things that are coming, and you prepare for the things you don't know are coming. And so that's uh, a part and parcel, I think, has to be part of building a sustainable community. One of the tasks that Governor Lee and Girl has charged the Bureau with is to take a look at the, uh, the government's overall planning process, which is rather balkanized and done by separate, um, separate groups under separate uh, um, uh, mandates here. But to, to try and move the government planning process to a uh, comprehensive database socioeconomic planning. And part of that is also to build, build not only sustainable community, but building resiliency. Uh, you build in resiliency in an economy by diversifying it. So it's not dependent on two things. You, re, you be, build resiliency in a population by ensuring there's adequate education and support services so they can uh, have the wherewithal not just to get uh, decent jobs, but to, to handle the task of the, that comes when the next generation takes over from us in making decisions for our community. And you build resiliency by taking steps on a proactive me uh, measure to um, protect um, our environmental heritage, including our coral reefs. Uh, one thing that's, that not everyone is aware of, but we, over the last decade, Guam has lost 30% of its coral in the shallow waters. And we've come to over the last six years, five of the last six years, have we endured major bleaching events, which is, by the way, unprecedented anywhere in the globe. And so it's a very serious problem. Right now, we've, last year seems to be okay. This year, they're, they're still taking the satellite data, so we don't can see what happened this year. But steps have to be taken to build the resiliency for future bleaching events, for other effects from climate change, and for stuff that we can't fully predict, like if the Florida disease or, uh, is actually uh, being transmitted by, by shipping, and if that is supposed to be a problem for Guam. So these issues have to be incorporated in an overall uh, planning, uh, planning as well for, for resiliency. And it's, it sounds like a large, daunting task, and it is, but I, I honestly believe this community is up to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Mr. Larry Gast from the Guam Solid Waste Admin, uh, Administration. Authority, I'm sorry. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Please excuse my southern accent. It's, uh, I've only been like 36 days on island, 37 days on island, so uh, I'm fairly new and I haven't gotten rid of uh, my southern drawl quite yet, but hopefully I will. Right now I'm knee deep in alligators trying to get my head around what everything is and what everything is going on. Uh, hopefully they don't get much higher. Um, it is uh, a wonderful, chance to be here. I have to say all of the permanent residents on this island have been extremely friendly, extremely nice, and concerned about the environment. They really are. And part of the solid waste responsibilities is to look after the environment. And that is what I plan to do. I've got to change my outlook a little here back in the States. Here, I've got to start looking 100 years into the future instead of 50 years into the future. This is a small island with limited land space. Landfills take up land space. In the mainland, we generally look about 50 years into the future because we've got to decide where the next landfill is going to be when the current one fills up. Well, unfortunately, with this island as small as it is, half of it with a karst geology, uh, it makes your choices of placing a landfill very limited. So you've got to start looking at evolving technologies. 
which one of the ones in the future that are looking the brightest is the laser arc gasification. I mean, yeah, laser arc gasification. Plasma arc gasification, sorry. Uh, the plasma arc gasification works on bench scale, research scale. There's been two facilities that have been built commercially. Both of those failed and were sold for scrap metal. But that technology is on the, on the verge. It may come. When those kinds of things happen, that's what we gotta look at taking a step toward. It does things that we can't do right now. It gets rid of your waste. It helps process recyclables and it provides energy. And that's the kind of things that we need to look forward to. Solid waste is something that everybody has. Unfortunately, this economy is based on tourism. And with a tourist-based economy, the tourists, when they come in, they're not worried about recycling. They're not worried about using reusable plates or reusable glasses or reusable bottles. They're interested in spending their 14 days and going back home where there they use their plates, their bottles, their glasses. So it's going to be a little bit of a challenge in a tourist-based economy to get the waste stream down. But I can tell everybody here, there's one thing that you can do, and it's just one little thing. If you see a plastic bag that you pick up to get rid of, or if you get a plastic bag to get rid of, don't leave it whole when you put it in the trash. Tie it in a knot. Put a bunch of them together, tie them in a knot. Because if you've ever gone to a landfill and watched the garbage truck back open up, and then you've got these kites that come flying out of the back of the truck, and before anybody can do anything, they're 30, 40 feet in the air. And the next thing that you know, they're a mile and a half away. So if just by making sure if plastic bags are thrown away, tie them up so they don't become a sail, a kite, and fly off. One of my other plans for the Solid Waste Authority is to start a educational program to start with elementary schools. A lot of times mom and dads are too busy to be concerned about recycling. They're too busy to be concerned about composting if they have the land and the capabilities of doing that. But by creating an educational program where we can go out and say, this is what you put in your recycle bin. This is what you use there. Don't, whatever you do, have a party that weekend and say, oh, I've got this leftover stuff, but no space in my garbage can. Let me just put it in my recycle container. Now all of that has become contaminated and is not recyclable any longer. It has all become waste. These are the kinds of situations that you can teach the young. They could go home and correct their parents. And that is one of the best ways to get started is to have the the parents corrected by the children. Because then they go, ooh, my child is interested. I'm going to do my part to help out. So those are a few of the things. One of the things I'd like to do is try to get some of the areas cleaned up. Um, I drive around. I'm a garbage man. My training is entomology. That was what my college degree was in, with a co-major in economics. I spent 20 years at Kennedy Space Center. Another, I spent uh, nine years at another tourist-heavy economy, Orange County, Orlando, Florida. And then I spent the last six years at a rural economy, which was based on agriculture, was their primary basis. So I've had a gambit all the way around, but I see things that shouldn't be. I see tires all over the island. <coughs> Excuse me. Tires set off the public health 
instinct in me immediately. When people improperly dispose of tires, they're increasing the breeding of mosquitoes. Increasing the breeding of mosquitoes increases the chances of mosquito-borne disease outbreaks. Unlike most of the places in the United States, your chances of mosquito-borne outbreaks are 12 months out of the year. You don't have a downtime. It is warm enough for them to breed continuously. Things as small as a soda cap will breed mosquitoes. Those kinds of things need to be properly disposed of. They need to be properly taken care of. I hope that by working with other organizations and the elected officials uh, here on Guam that I will be able to change an attitude within people and also increase the desire for people to do what's right, what's healthy, and what is good for the environment. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Guest. <laughs> We'd be happy to help you here at the Center for Island Sustainability with your educational outreach initiatives. We, um, we do outreach almost every day, so we'd be happy to talk about that. And um, first gentleman, Mr. Cook, I know you don't uh, run an agency, but you're... Um, <laughs> I, I'm an agency of one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were really excited when we heard about your interest in recycling, um, so we'd, lo we'd like to hear some of your plans for... Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's in the germination stage at this point, and it's been that since uh, my wife won the election. Um, but I did even talk about it during the campaign. I'm, I've been a, a recycler as far back as I can remember. Um, long before we actually had bins to put it in, I would take it to the various places where you could re recycle. So personally, I think it's an important thing we all do. Um, Larry sort of took some of the wind out of some of my ideas. I don't have a wonderful accent like he does. But just a couple weeks ago, I was at uh, a Head Start class and uh, about 10 minute presentation on recycling to three, four, and five year olds. And that was the idea. I told them, you go home and tell your parents what we talked about today. And they had all. They had all made things out of recyclables. So they had robots made with bottles and stuff. Unfortunately, I don't know what's gonna end up with those recyclable models they made at the end. Hopefully they'll at least get them into the recycling bins. Um, my, I've talked to a number of people who have approached me. I've got a list going. I'm gonna hopefully get our group together in the next 30 days and start trying to figure out what my agency <laughs> can do. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, it's, there's people from the recycling arena, there's people from the business arena. Um, one of the things that definitely we need to work on, and we'll start with my wife's office, meaning Adaloop, is recycling white paper, uh, recycling aluminum, recycling, I mean, make sure that they have those bins everywhere and people are using them. And, and I was very interested in the discussion, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to be at the whole symposium, <clears throat> but the whole thing about the plastics. Um, obviously, the, uh, like Mr. Gass just pointed out, there's bags, that's a real terrible problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. I uh, applaud Payless for uh, pushing non-plastic bags. Um, one of the things I was wondering is whether or not we could get the, some company to donate some bags and put it in all the hotel rooms for the tourists. Because as Mr. Gass was saying, chances are if they're just going to go over to pay less, they're not going to have a, a bag, so they'll use a plastic bag. But if one was made available to them, I think an awful lot of the tourists might very well say, oh. I'll take the bag with me when I walk over to Payless or whichever store it is and use it. So I think some real simple things like that could help with down some of the plastics. Another thing, I, and I, I heard was a discussion about maybe some sort of, in my mind, there sh should be able to be, um, we should be able to find some investors, whether they're local or maybe from Asia, uh, maybe looking to know, get a hold into Guam and for immigration purposes, people do that. They like to invest in Guam and businesses. 
and bring in some small factories that could take, for instance, the plastics and turn them into uh, furniture and other things for like the parks. Um, there's, I know that's done in other places. Uh, they basically can make plastic wood and then they use it for projects. Um, granted, we may not have the large capacity of uh, volume of the plastics, but I think a small factory like that could probably work. So I think that's one of the things, uh, when I get this group together, I want to try to start talking about if we can put our feelers out and see what's available. I was, I'm very interested, and in, obviously Hawaii is, is very far ahead in a lot of things. I understand one of the things they have there is the Tour de Trash. It's a yearly, um, uh, where they take people from the public, whether they're business people, recyclers or whatever, and they go around and see all of the operations for dealing with waste. And uh, as Mr. Gass says, uh, he's, he's a trash man. Well, to be quite honest, we all are, because we all create trash. And uh, you know, the less trash you can put into the bin to go to the dump, the better. I mean, we're already talking about having to build another cell. And once again, that's a major issue of not recycling. The more stuff we can put into a bin, but we have to find a way to deal with it on Guam. Uh, I was speaking to a, a gentleman from Pyramid, and he was telling me that whereas they used to be able to sell, sell the plastic when they sent it off, they now have to pay, I think it was Indonesia he mentioned, they pay them to take the plastic. They still ship it, but now he's literally paying somebody to take it. And the trouble is, from a sustainability of the world, it's probably going into a dump in Indonesia. It's not being used effectively in some sort of recycled to create something new. And, and that is obviously one of the major problems with plastics. So I've just got ideas. Uh, anybody who wants to throw me ideas, send me an email. If you want to join my agency. <laughs> uh, since I don't get paid, all these other wonderful people are, they're, they're employees of my wife. <laughs> I'm an employee of my wife too, but I don't get paid. Uh, so, but uh, we need all work together and uh, I appreciate being uh, here. It's kind of funny though, um, that uh, I'm an agency and the other day I was at a GMH Volunteer Association and they mistakenly said I was the first gentleman. So they, I guess maybe I've been gaining weight so people think I'm more than one person. So I am just one. So thank you again everybody and, and keep up the great work. Thank you all for the insights into your, your agencies, your agencies of many and of one. And uh, we, I have lots of questions for them, but uh, we, we have about uh, five minutes left on this panel, and I want to leave it up to all of you to, uh, to have some questions. Uh, we have some mics in the back. If you would like to, um, if you have a question for anybody in specific, please uh, mention them. And I think our first question is from uh, uh, Senator Torres. You are all very inspiring, uh, and I would like to have follow-up questions with you. But Mr. Ty Tyrone Taichno specifically, there is a big push lately for the cruise industry, cruise line industry throughout Micronesia. And many of my concerns and, and about that um, falls in line with, with the topics that you brought up about you know ships and the danger to reefs. So I, I wonder, is, is that something that that you would be willing to engage in conversation with the proponents of a, a cruise line industry throughout Micronesia? Because I believe there's a lot more to it than, than just another uh, tourism opportunity that can generate funds. Well, uh, as you know, Senator, there are, an, again, a number of proposals. These can actually draft land use plans that, that kind of call for that sort of activity here. And I, I think my, as we move in that sort of direction, I think it would bear that to have a, a more robust uh, review of these things by all the, the planning and the land use and the resource management agencies. You know, sometimes these proposals, they, they coast along and, and people don't know whether to take them seriously or not. As you know, a, a, a planning process is only as effective as the stakeholders actually buy into it and get engaged. And quite often these things move along 
And it's, it's like we all see that example of like uh, when Public Works is about to like build something like a sidewalk or something and they, they send out the notice six or 12 months in advance, but no one takes it seriously. But as soon as the ground's breaking, then all of a sudden people take it seriously. So I think as um, perhaps as the rules and one of the things I'm trying to look at in, in examining the overall GovGuam planning process and, and particularly the land use process is to get that system more engaged. Um, I have noticed there have been a couple land use and some of these uh, proposals here where the, they go through the motions of like inviting comment, but even when the comments come in and you look at the end product at the end, it's almost as if they didn't pay attention to it. And so, in, in, but, and this stuff gets caught at the end rather than the beginning. So what I, I'm trying to achieve here in, in, in looking at the planning process, the economic planning process, the land use planning process, is something that, that builds in that's, that sort of engagement. That uh, the core reef, uh, resilience strategy the governor's embarked upon, it has a system whereby there, there will be a working group in each of the five areas and they provide uh, re biannual reports to an executive le leadership twice a year. So you have that ongoing reporting engagement thing. It's not just check the box and move on. And it's, it's my hope too as we look at the overall planning process to so, sort of apply that model there. So it's not just check the box and move on but it's an active ongoing engagement because a lot of these things move. I mean, um, issues dealing, for example, with Agatna, I mean, that, that thing from the floodplain has gone on for like more than a generation. And even the studies done for it are kind of out of date, but still people, you know, make plans based on, on, on what, what's available. So I think, I think that's the way to deal with it, for not just the cruise issue, but a whole range of land use and research management issues. Let's see, uh, do we have another question for the audience, from the audience? I have a few questions. Yes. We'll, uh, we'll take one. Oh, man. Uh. Okay, so I guess my, one of the, I guess I have a lot, but one of them that I was thinking of was, you know how Hawaii has what? They banned uh, sunblock use on their island or something like that, like a particular brand. Is there a reason why we can't ban bottled water from coming into Guam? I mean, I, I know everyone's saying it's, a, it's about convenience and everything like that, but in reality, we used to always bring the five-gallon cooler to our soccer games, our football games, and everything like that, and people would just, you know, reuse their cups. Now it's all out of convenience, 100% convenience. Well, you know, just buy the bottled water and everyone can do it. And if bottled water is one of our biggest issues, it's in every hotel two per room, per day, per hour, per whatever you call it. I mean, to me, that's like one of the biggest, boldest moves a small island can make. Thank and you, Roseanne. We'll have Mr. Guest uh, try to answer that. What, one of the things about bottled water is that if you have a water outage, that's the way that people are going to get their water is if you have a major water break, you've got to have a way to get water to people, and that will be bottled water. But the way to curb that is economics. Make the cost of bottled water higher. I was asked one time, why does nobody in Florida, except for the 19 places that are there, build waste energy plants? And it's because it's cheaper to put it in the ground in a hole. They said, well, how can you fix that? I said, you put a $50 a ton charge on every ton of garbage, and now it's at the same price as sending it to a waste energy plant. That's it. You've got to hit it economically to stop it. Okay, one more question. <laughs> also on the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Senator Munya Barnes and her previous time in this legislature had passed a water uh, a bottle bill with a deposit for cans and, and bottles. As far as I know, for some reason, that's never gone into effect. And that goes back to economics. If you put a five or cent deposit on every bottle and can on this island, somebody will pick it up, wherever it's at. I agree with you. <clears throat> Having a container of five gallons, <coughs> excuse me, makes a lot more sense. But people are going to use bottled water. There is a need for it at times. 
but make it cost effective. And one way to do it, I know it's difficult maybe for the, the uh, retailers to maybe have to deal with that, but the bottom line is if there's, if that, just like aluminum, a lot of people will take their aluminum or give it to the schools. Do the same thing with the plastic bottles. Enforce that a bottle bill, and uh, I think that would help a lot toward at least getting it picked up and put in the right place. Thank you. Did we have a last question? Dr. Lemmer. Thank you. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. First, I would like to say, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I think we all appreciate all uh, what all of you are doing and what you're thinking about doing. Just one comment, I heard it today and yesterday when we say we are all affected by climate change despite being um, responsible for it here on Guam. I think that's part of the problem. We are all responsible for climate change. It's not the others who are causing it. We are, I don't know, have you seen how many cars there are on this little island? I know my neighbors has seven cars in front of their house. I don't even know if there's seven people in this house. Also, um, the state of public transportation on Guam. I think the um, economy, not the economy, the, the, the economy of Guam is participating to climate change globally. So I think once we recognize that we are also part of the problem, it also helps us, you know, take a stand and try to do better. That was just what I wanted to Thank say. Thank you, Dr. Lamaran. So I'm going to have one a final response from Ms. Respicio because of. Uh, we, had, uh, we have this month, Island Sustainability Month and Earth Month. So what's one recommendation um, from the Guam Energy Office that we can all do? Well, just um, I want to agree with that, that comment, definitely. And um, gosh, just everybody do your part, seriously. There are things you could do just at the basic home front. Unplug anything that's not being used before you leave your house. Put everything on a surge protector. Turn off the switch. Um, just simple things that you can you can do by smarter, please. Um, I forgot to mention that one of the legislation um, that's uh, in the works is that the government of Guam will be required to purchase if they are going to procure anything, they will have to purchase energy efficient appliances. So we are working with Gura, Guam Housing, and other agencies that do procure appliances. It has to be energy efficient. So that's going to change for the island. Government will be at the forefront, but all everyone needs to do their part. And we will do our part at the Guam Energy Office to reach out to the community in as many creative ways as possible on the little things you can do. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our whole panel here.